That's okay. I don't um, just want to welcome everybody to the Health and Social Care Services Subcommittee um, this afternoon, and we'll go straight to item one, which is confirmation of the chair. <laughs> oh, right, that's just me. Um, it was a Sinn Féin nominee, and my party colleagues nominated me to take it, and I accepted. So um, I'll be chairing the, this committee for, the, for, the, for this year anyway. Um, item two is apologies, and I have one apology from Stephen McCann. Um, do we have any more? No, nobody's indicating, so it's just Stephen then. Item three, to sign the minutes. Right, okay. It is to sign the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 17th of February, um, and that will be done now this afternoon. Item four is um, declarations of interest. If anybody has any declarations of it, I will, because I'm a very proud employee of the NHS and trusts. So that's my declaration of interest. Um, if anybody else has any. Anne-Marie. Hey, Debbie, I don't work for the trust, but I work with um, NAS. OK, thank you. OK. And I think that's it. Um, so item five are matters arising from the last minute. OK, so we'll go page by page, page one, page two. Page three, page four, page five, page six, page seven, page eight, and page nine. So, no, okay, there's no, so there's no matters arising from that. And so, we'll go on to item six, um, to consider terms of reference of this group. Let me just bring it up here. I'm guessing that everybody's read through these. So we'll go. Do you want to go? Do you want to talk on this, John? Yeah, yes, yeah. Chair. Okay. Ju just in, in relation to the, 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 you will see there the track changes on the, from what has been the previous committee. Uh, you'll notice that it is a health and social care subcommittee rather, rather than a group. Um, and uh, the purpose of the group also is included there is to work collaboratively in partnership to help inform and recommend uh, on the delivery of health and social uh, care services. Um, the, and, and there are various uh, additions uh, regarding uh, the trust and changes about the trust uh, to foster an open and transparent dialogue with the Council, keeping each other informed, engaging local knowledge and key issues which may impact or improve health and social care services uh, delivery. Um, and you will also see that the key objectives, uh, the changes that have been uh, made through them, uh, through discussion and consideration of evidence-based agenda, uh, health promotion, health literacy, uh, so it, it widens out the, the range of, of objectives. Um, uh, and, and also, I suppose, in the, the assessment to consider the health and wellbeing needs assessment for the Fermanagh and Oma District Council, uh, which enables the subcommittee to understand the areas which are most, uh, which are most challenged and most in, in, most in need. 
um, and to understand the provision of health and social care services uh, delivered by a range of organisations. So other organisations can feed into this subcommittee, the public health agency, uh, the, the primary care, such as GPs, uh, community pharmacists, so on, and the community and voluntary sector, indeed, and indeed, uh, NIAS. Um, the subcommittee will also engage separately with the trust in, and, and other groups when applicable, and, and they are listed there in section 2.3 of the term, terms of reference. Um, and then the membership uh, is, is also lost noted. You will note members that membership from the trust will include the appointed trust lead director for Fermanagh Noma District Council, trust public affairs lead, together with the premium members from the chief executives, directors, senior management were relevant to be in attendance uh, at, at the meetings. Uh, the meetings will be held quarterly via WebEx uh, and will commence at, at, at 3 p.m. Um, and, and there may also be a requirement to call extraordinary meetings at, of the subcommittee to help inform and, and advise of, of the issues. Uh, those are the main changes, uh, Chair, for, for the terms of reference of the subcommittee. Um, thank, thanks, John. And just um, from myself here, I just think that um, moving forward and working collaboratively and having an open and transparent communication to benefit our hospitals and our health service and all the people of the Fermanagh and Oma, Oma district area is a and for all it is a positive way forward and that's the way that we intend to work going forward and i'm really happy enough with these changes made i'll bring you in now errol thank you very much chair and thanks to director john boyle for taking us through the terms of reference uh, updated uh, i think you mentioned it yourself there chair with the collaboration uh, the transparency uh, i think uh, there are two key elements moving forward so I'm happy to propose the adoption of the updated terms of reference. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Can we have somebody to second, please? Chair, is it appropriate right. for me to recommend uh, seconding yes. them? Okay, so thank you. Chair. No problem. And everybody's in agreement, yeah? Yeah, happy enough, Chair. Sorry, couldn't get in there. Yeah, yeah, happy. that's okay. Um, do we go on to the next one now? This one, terms of reference. Any changes there? Oh, that's all done. Yeah, okay. So we will now go on to item seven, and I'll hand over to us. And just to thank you, because I should have thanked you at the beginning just to thank you all for uh, coming in today so we'll hand over to you now and um, for the report thank you okay so Theresa Malloy our director of performance and service improvement will present this today chair thank you thank you chair and thank you colleagues so I've been invited today to speak to uh, an information item which is about the consultation findings report uh, on the uh, issue of the uh, Southwest Acute Hospital Emergency General Surgery te uh, Temporary Suspension, which was enacted at the end of last year. Uh, and the consultation commenced, as we all know, at the start of this year. Um, colleagues, the presentation will be in two parts. Um, I will step through the findings report uh, and the consultation process. Um, it was my responsibility within the Trust to support the trust in undertaking a consultation process in the required manner. And then Mark Gillespie um, will, uh, at the end of this briefing, take us through uh, some updates on that position because the consultation findings report was presented to our trust board in July. And there is information which is uh, even more up to date than that, which uh, this committee may uh, find of interest. So Mark will do that uh, in the final part of the presentation. Um, so, if I could start just by talking about the, t the background to the temporary suspension uh, of emergency general surgery in Southwest Acute Hospital. Um, and it's, it's really to go over ground that I think most members will be very familiar with. 
Um, but obviously the, um, the issue of long-standing workforce gaps in SWA in general surgery uh, con uh, con at consultant level has been known for some time and has been on, on our risk register in the trust uh, for some time. And of course, members will be aware that we've had previous summits and, and uh, other engagements in relation to that particular risk. Um, we did commence a, a trust-wide review of general surgery. So that was in relation to the provision of SWA, OMA and Alt McGelvin. Um, and we were part way through that when um, the particular issues arose with Southwest Acute Hospital um, consultant staffing. And those uh, changes happened over a very short time period. And that's set out in the findings document. Um, and those happened really between October and November uh, of 2022. The work of the trust was to protect public health and to uh, uh, design alternative pathways uh, to maintain safe care to the population, um, to test those pathways and to bring them into uh, operationalization. Uh, um, and we did go through a very formal process where the approval of the temporary suspension was brought to our trust board in November 22. Um, we did receive approval and support from uh, the Department of Health and then we moved through the uh, implementation of those pathways through a test phase from the 5th of September and then formally to shift to the new pathways uh, from the 19th of December. Um, so that's really the timeline, Chair, in relation to the consultation. Um, I suppose to, to give you some sense uh, of the, um, the listening within the consultation process and how people engaged, we did use a little infographic in our findings report um, but really to cover the broad sense of this, um, the trust was determined, certainly I was determined, that we would undertake a full 12-week consultation uh, on the temporary change, and that did commence in January 23. <clears throat> you, you will see um, the, uh, the ways in which we consulted and gathered in information uh, in the infographic. Um, and we did present then the findings report to our trust board on the 6th of July of this year. Um, the, the report has since been published and is on all uh, trust channels and um, I think it's entirely appropriate, Chair, that we uh, would present uh, what was in those findings and in that findings report to this committee. However, I know that members of the committee will have had access to the material and the findings report itself online since the 6th of July and Oliver and Chris and the team have had that available to the population. Um, to, to read and digest since that time. The findings report itself uh, reflects um, a range of themes which emerged from the range of uh, consultation events and consultation responses that we received. And this is a, a customary approach that where there are large numbers of responses that we would be required within our consultation findings or outcomes reports to theme those um, and then uh, those themes and the uh, representation of those in the report enables the trust's management team and, of course, the trust board on the 7th of July to formally listen to the feedback and uh, the concerns of the community. Just the next slide there, Chris. Um, so we did theme the issues into nine areas. Um, and within the findings report, we provided a trust response in each of those nine areas. Um, and um, Chris, if you just move on to the next slide, uh, these were the nine areas that uh, we have articulated the concerns in the findings report and where we gave formal uh, trust responses in the findings report, Chair. Um, Neil has asked me to just very quickly go through the nine areas just so that members do have an opportunity to understand the breadth of coverage within those areas and some of the key points which arose and where we gave a response. So I will start with the recruitment and retention of staff at the Southwest Acute Hospital. Um, and certainly across the events and in the responses, there was a reflection on the difficulty the Trust had in attracting staff um, to the Southwest Acute Hospital. There, you? Um, <clears throat> there were suggestions and queries about how the trust could use pay and benefit incentives and other incentives to attract staff to SWA. Many respondents felt that there wasn't enough effort being made to attract staff to SWA. Um, there were questions about why the trust 
We're recruiting for staff across the trust geography and not specifically for SWA. Um, and some respondents made assertions around our retention rate of consultants in SWA. Um, and generally, there was a perceived lack of confidence about the future recruitment and retention of staff in the Southwest Acute Hospital. Um, and in the trust response, we, we stepped through a number of issues, Chair, where we tried to provide more information and uh, a, a factual position to uh, inform uh, the findings report. So uh, in our response, we talked through the recruitment exercises and the outcome of those exercises. And the fact that as a result of those and that we had not been able to recruit, we had moved to recruit general surgeons to trust wide posts. And if I could just say that um, Mark will bring you up to date on the outcomes in relation to the recruitment exercises in his part of the presentation. So I won't dwell on that further. Um, we did respond to the questions about recruitment and retention incentives. It was clear that there was really very little information in the public domain uh, about how those work in Northern Ireland and HSC. Um, so we did provide information about the Department of Health's position in relation to incentives. And the Department of Health itself is required to and does set policy in respect of recruitment premia, uh, any salary premia for, for consultants or other staff. And the trusts do not have the discretion to apply a recruitment premium uh, without the prior approval of the Department of Health. Um, <clears throat> the, the guidance that the Department of Health provides on this does recognise that recruitment premia would have the potential effect of further destabilising the overall HSC system with um, the potential of a, 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 almost an internal market. So the, the policy is very careful to cater uh, uh, for premia in the event where the whole of the HSC benefits by a post being filled from an applicant currently working outside of HSC rather than in another part of Northern Ireland in HSC. Um, we also provided information about the fact that a business case is required and must be approved when any trust wants to apply for a premia for any post um, and that the maximum payment in a premia uh, is not allowed to be any more than 10% of the starting salary um, and it is linked to an expectation that the doctor will stay in post for at least two years. But I suppose the, world, the, the, the issue in this is really about the attractiveness of a 10% uplift when the market and the competition for consultants particularly um, is very significant at this time. We then in this section um, give more information on the work that we as a trust do in international medical recruitment. Um, and I would say to you, uh, Chair and, and members of the committee, that I believe that uh, the Western Trust have the most developed international medical recruitment service uh, of all of the trusts in Northern Ireland. We have been undertaking this work since uh, 2015. Uh, and we have made a number of appointments through the use of international medical recruitment and that's set out both at consultant and middle and junior doctor uh, grade in the report. Um, and then finally in this section we provide information on uh, how the trust has provided uh, a kind of promotional material on Southwest Acute Hospital within our recruitment campaigns and certainly our, our HR and comm staff have worked very assiduously and promoting uh, posts uh, across a, a range of channels and those are set out in the report and um, Oliver can certainly make available to you some of the material that we use although if you click on some of the consultant job ads you will see some of that um, and uh, we've been doing a huge amount of promotion of SWA and how advantageous it is to work in SWA on our social media platforms. And our, our consultants and our medical staff actually have been helping us, helping us with that, with testimonials um, and, you know, an insight to how it is to work in, in this hospital. I mean, I suppose I would finish, Chair, by saying, uh, and this is not specifically referred to in the report, but it is the reality that uh, we, in our recruitment campaigns, compete constantly with a, a very significant negative, uh, negative narrative uh, across uh, press and media channels and unfortunately we are battling that all the time. I'll move then to the second theme which is travel times for service users and carers and families and 
perceived patient safety risk to rural service users. Um, and in this section of the report, um, uh, we recognise that uh, there is a considerable, uh, there was considerable concern in the responses about the additional travel time for patients who require emergency general surgery. Um, and there was a, a lot of reference to the whole issue of the golden hour and the perception that um, 60 minutes would make a huge difference to uh, uh, patients who required emergency general surgery and therefore there were implications for the safety of the new pathways. Um, there was also a reflection uh, back in the report of the difficulty in travelling longer distances for family and friends to visit um, their family and patients in Alt McGelvin or Craigavon hospitals uh, and we recognise that in the report and those concerns and that really um, I suppose uh, revolved around not just distance but the issues of uh, road quality um, and uh, the difficult travel conditions particularly at times of the year. So the Trust did provide a response on both of those issues in the findings report um, uh, we did refer to the Golden Hour and Brendan as our medical director has not just in this report but quite publicly spoken about the relevance of the Golden Hour um, to our pathways and, and again we can talk about um, incidents and uh, issues of ensuring uh, safe patient pathways during Mark's presentations because we have, we have lots of evidence now that we're a number of months on in delivering these pathways. We recognise, and in fact in the report, we accepted the challenges uh, to patients and families um, when accessing um, healthcare in the West, particularly in the rural areas uh, of Fermanagh. Um, there is a hospital travel cost scheme, but I mean the Trust um, absolutely recognises and acknowledges the challenges and difficulties that families do face in accessing services at this time in the rural areas. The third area uh, is uh, an area which was specifically one for our Department of Health and we sought um, support from them in, res in the response in this section. So that was about the review of general surgery, the regional review of general surgery in Northern Ireland. Um, and um, we did um, go into that in our consultation document and the requirement that was placed on us to comply with the new standards, the new regional standards which had been introduced uh, for both Alt McGelvin and SWA and for every hospital in Northern Ireland. And during the consultation, particularly in the public meetings, uh, the Trust was questioned about whether these regional standards had been consulted on and had been a quality uh, proofed and rural screened. Uh, <clears throat> and there were questions about the legality of the department's decision to introduce the standards. And, and I won't go into the department's response, but we provide the department's response verbatim in uh, our consultation findings report and they were very firm about the processes used um, and the legality uh, of the decision to introduce those standards. The fourth area was uh, really around the views of and concerns around SWA as a type one emergency department um, and the future of the acute status of SWA and concerns around that. So, um, in this section of the report, uh, we felt it was important to play back um, really the very many messages that uh, came through in the public meetings and consultation responses uh, where respondents really felt great pride and respect for the hospital and the staff who provide the services. Um, excellent facilities in the hospital came out time and time again and, and often the hospital was referred to by respondents as a state-of-the-art facility. Um, it response queried the risk, the future risk to the acute status of the hospital and to the grading of the emergency department in the hospital as a result of the temporary change. Um, and our response to that, uh, we did step through the type 1 ED and we were very firm in saying that uh, while there was a Northern Ireland definition at this point in time, that was not consistent with the NHS definition of a type 1 ED and that the Department of Health are and have actually changed the definition of a type 1 ED um, and that now aligns with the NHS definition. So uh, you will see that in the findings report. Um, and we did play back uh, from statements from the Department of Health that uh, uh, their intention was that uh, SWA would remain with a type 1 emergency department um, and again we set that out for bottom within the report. 
Um, there was also confusion uh, around the role of general surgeons in obstetric care. Um, so essentially their role in delivering cesarean sections and that actually came out time and time again, particularly at the public meetings. So again, factually we set out in the findings report the fact that emergency cesarean sections are only carried out uh, by obstetrics and gynaecology senior doctors in the UK and Ireland and are not carried out by general surgeons. Um, that, so our, our service remains unchanged. And then finally on the future of the acute status of SWA, um, <clears throat> we referred to the developments uh, which were announced in November last year to uh, uh, progressively move to implement a third overnight elective stay centre in Northern Ireland and that SWA would be that centre. And again, Mark will provide more information on what has happened uh, over the course of this year and uh, how we've progressed with that work. Section five and the fifth theme uh, really refers to patient pathways and the bypass protocols. Um, and again, um, <clears throat> we um, wanted to play back in this section the concerns that we heard about patient safety, uh, the times uh, that are for conveyance to hospital and the risk that that might occasion, the use of the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service and private ambulances and the additional workload uh, for Alton McGelvin and Craig Avon. And we did give a response. In fact, we, um, we did set out again because we felt it was appropriate uh, in the findings report all of the pathways which we had introduced and gave assurances around how those were working. But Mark will again go over that ground in a more current way uh, in his part of this presentation. And he will also um, provide information on the ongoing partnership working uh, with the Ambulance Service and the Southern Trust um, and uh, the uh, oversight arrangements for this change and how those have continued. So I think, Mark, I think I will probably leave for the, to be kind of timely in this presentation. I'll leave that to the end of the presentation because more of the information will be provided. Section six um, sets out the concerns and questions that the trust dealt with during the consultation process about its decision making. Um, and I think it is important that we say to this committee that we recognize the frustration and sometimes anger and the expression of a lack of trust that was raised in the Western Trust senior management team and the trust board. Um, and in, in the uh, response, in the, in the findings report, we tried to emphasize how quickly this change had to happen, uh, that it was an emergency change, um, and that we did comply in that emergency change with the requirements that are placed on us, both legally and by the Department of Health in its circular on change or withdrawal of services. And we are absolutely content that the steps that we took and the process that we undertook uh, is legal and uh, we have independent advice that supports that. Section seven of the report um, played back um, the um, kind of undercurrent that we were dealing with and the questions that we were receiving at particularly the public meetings um, where there was a, a really an ongoing issue uh, around the questions about whether this had a potential, this was a potential step towards privatisation and a suspicion really that the uh, privatisation of SWA was, was the eventual intent at some point in time and we were really firm in our trust response in this section to, uh, to that uh, issue. Um, we, we, um, we as a trust are asked to run this hospital which is a PFI hospital uh, and decisions were made some years ago as, as members of this committee I'm sure will know uh, politically, that we would proceed to have a, a PFI hospital and were um, and, and Southwest Acute Hospital. Um, and the findings report, um, it, it seeks to put um, in the public domain facts. Uh, they are in the public domain already, actually, but uh, we repeated them in the findings report about what the PFI does and what the cost of the PFI is and what that cost covers. Um, and that is not just the building itself, but the maintenance of the building the equipment and the systems, and that the PFI provider is responsible for replacing all of those equipment and systems when they've reached the end of their accepted life at no additional cost to the trust throughout the 30-year life of the contract. 
and importantly, because there was misconception about this, it was clear as we listened to the questions that came to us. Uh, the trust uh, will receive back and, uh, the hospital at the end of the contract and it will be ours after that 30 years and it will be fully up to date, fully maintained and with no backlog maintenance. So um, clearly at the end of that section, we said the trust has no policy or operational processes to engage with the private sector on the running of SWA or its future other than managing the PFI contract to ensure performance, compliance and value for money. Section 8 uh, provides information on our equality screening, um, the impacts on a number of the Section 75 groups and provides the facts that we had gathered at that point in time. But members will know with equality screening this is an ongoing process and regularly revisited. And the final section is um, I think a, a very fulsome um, a reflection of um, I'll call it a petition that we received, um, which was uh, 30,268 uh, signed leaflets um, from uh, uh, CFR Acute Services and signed by members of the population. And we play out, I think, fairly fulsomely uh, the information that was in those, and we provide a response to each of those, uh, with, the, with the exception of the first point. Sorry, there were two first points. Um, um, across all of the information that we received um, but we did not think it was appropriate to comment on the establishment of a separate trust for the South West. Um, that is not a matter for the trust. But we do go through in the findings report each of the five areas and I suppose really um, and hopefully members have had time to read this, um, it was an opportunity for us to actually set out some of the uh, really key facts uh, around the information that was put in the, in the public domain as part of the SOAS campaign, particularly the fact that um, the five theatres uh, in the South West Acute Hospital were never all commissioned. Uh, three theatres were commissioned at the opening of the hospital, so there have always been two uncommissioned theatres, and uh, the impression was given that we had either decommissioned uh, theatres and that had never been the case. So um, I'm going to hand over now to uh, Mark Gillespie um, and Mark is going to take us through the more recent information just for uh, committee members on um, how uh, the services have been progressing during the period of the temporary suspension uh, heard. Mark, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Teresa. Thank you, Chair. Um, so if I can then just take you back to the current service position in terms of where we're at at this point in time. Since the pathways have been in operation since late December, um, there have been no changes um, to how we've operated those. Um, and we had agreed um, as an organisation that we would do a stock take of a pathways, which was planned for September um, of this year, and indeed took place last week with all key stakeholders to identify any opportunities for any improvement or learning. At that meeting, we explored all aspects of the, of the pathways. Um, and could see no episodes of clinical harm um, and were made no recommendations at that point to change any of those pathways. We believed as a team um, that those were working and were working well um, at this point in time. New ambulatory care services are, are working successfully in minimising transfers from Southwest Acute Hospital. Um, you will remember that at the outset in our planning assumptions we had identified the need for admission of up to five patients, between four and five patients at Alton and Galvin on a daily basis. And we believe that that new ambulatory care service, which maximises the capability and the capacity at Southwest Acute Hospital with the surgical doctors that are currently in the organisation, um, mapped against our um, excellent facilities in terms of radiology, allows us to continue to build that service and to offer care close to home um, for patients in the local community. As part of our work, and as Teresa has mentioned, as, as part of the response, um, in the consultation, the travel times were very much at the fore um, in, front, in, in terms of the public's um, concerns. We recognise the need to provide safe care and some patients will need to have that in Alton Galvin Hospital. Um, but as soon as we can, um, we will repatriate those patients back when their acute surgical journey um, has been completed and they can have that care continued in Southwest Acute Hospital under the care of the physicians, the physios, the OTs and the very excellent services that we have. 
We've also done some work with uh, Professor Monica Monaghan um, on Southwest Acute Site as well too, um, to make sure that our pathways are robust for palliative care patients and any patients um, that don't need to be transferred can have their care facilitated um, and, and the excellent services that we find ourselves in. Um, in terms of Southwest Acute Elective Overnight Stay Centre, um, from the 1st of January 23 to July, 31st of July 23, including um, core activity for general surgery, we have undertaken 830 uh, procedures in Southwest Acute, 300 in general surgery, gynae 382, dental 107, and PEATS 41. There have been 43 overnight elective stay centre um, sessions which accounts for 172 patients. You will remember last week in, in uh, BBC News, there was a comparison made across all three elective overnight stay centres. Um, in the data that was published, um, the other trusts included all the core activity um, and their return, um, which meant that there was a variation and a difference between ourselves and themselves. If we were to look at the core data in terms of all the sessions and all the patients that were operated on here, um, we would very much be in line with them. Um, so. 830 patients um, since the 1st of um, January. Um, we continue in a very robust way um, to rebuild our surgical services in Southwest Acute. Uh, we are commissioned by the department to deliver 19.5 sessions, and at this present minute in time, we are delivering 11 of those sessions. Um, and we believe from the trajectory that we have um, in place that we will be in a position um, in December to be able to provide those 19.5 sessions um, in Southwest Acute Hospital. Um, very publicly across Northern Ireland, you will be made aware of nursing vacancies, um, particularly um, across a number of areas. One of those hard to recruit areas was um, theatres. Um, I'm pleased to say that with the work that we've engaged in with our HR teams and our clinical teams, um, our nursing position um, across Southwest Acute and OMA um, will improve and are continuing to improve um, as we as we uh, pay close attention to this particular area. So, within Southwest Acute. Um, we've also um, commenced breast surgery, which happens fortnightly, providing a service to ATSWA, which previously would have only been available at Alton McGavin. We're delivering five gynae inpatient sessions per week at SWA. And if you remember back um, to the consulta consultation, that was one of the things um, that the public had asked us for, was to think about how we could attract people um, to maintain that service. And one of the things came back from the clinicians was, we need to be operating um, in theatre. Um, and we've made that commitment and we continue to make that commitment and work with that team very closely um, on, a, on a weekly basis um, to look at other potential opportunities. As I said earlier on, the elective um, workload has significantly enhanced um, since January. And you remember um, during COVID, um, we, were, we, we struggled to provide elective services in Southwest Acute and sometimes um, could only provide up to two sessions per week. As I said, now we are back to 10-11, which is exactly the trajectory we said we would be at. Pediatric surgery, um, which is regional, has resumed as part of our rebuild. Um, and there is also mutual aid, as I said, um, for other peach surgery at the request of the regional elective care management team over this period. I've already talked about the sessions that we're funded for. Um, and we believe, as I said, we'll, we'll, we will be at full recovery by December um, 2023. There is also regional consideration to gynae surgery becoming a, a part of elective overnight stay. Um, and we can keep you updated on that as we work our through, way through those discussions um, with the elective care management team. I think 830 patients from the start of January um, has been a, a major change and a major transition for us in Southwest Acute in terms of making that commitment to the general public um, that we would recommence elective surgery. Um, and to achieve that number um, has meant that the Department of Health elective care management team um, deemed us appropriate to have the High Achievement Award um, received in August 23. And I think on the day that we came to meet staff, um, what that meant to staff on the ground was hugely important um, in terms of where they um, see themselves in terms of developing further elective services as we move forward um, in the Western Trust and indeed SWA. If I can then just focus um, for a minute or two on OMA as well. OMA, as you will remember from last week in the BBC, was focused on as part of the regional um, day procedure unit work as well. Um, and that work focuses on high intensity, sorry, high volume, low intensity work. Since the 1st of January, we have carried out procedures on 2,459 patients across a range of specialities including general surgery, urology, ENT, oral maxillofacial surgery, gynae surgery, pain, vascular work including veins, 
and endoscopy. We are funded there for 23 sessions, uh, have been funded for 23 sessions previously and had further investment in the last year from the department to develop a further four sessions, four of which were for urology and three of which were for general surgery, which were regional sessions. Together with the region, we've been in collaboration with Southern Trust and Southern Trust have been utilising some of those sessions on a regional basis as we move through. We've got a very clear direct trajectory to get us back to 30 sessions um, within OMA. Um, and by the end of this month, uh, we hope to be delivering in the region of 24 to 25 sessions consistently on a weekly basis. Given the waiting times for surgery and access, um, this will become a, a really important part of our capacity in terms of delivery uh, for patients in the population that we serve. Thank you. I think the two items at point eight have been covered, the elective overnight centre and the OMA day procedure centre uh, as part of that. That's okay, so it, is that you finished, yeah? Yeah, that, that's very informative and thank you for that. Um, we have two people in debating and I'm not sure who was first because this isn't telling me how do was it Victor? Victor, you're first in and I'll keep a note of who can't who else comes in. So go ahead Victor. Thank you for that, Chair, and thank you for the Trust for their information uh, today. Just a couple of points uh, that I'd like to highlight. Um, you've obviously mentioned that you're battling against the media channels um, for the negativity that's out there in the recruitment um, to get people to the SWA. Uh, that's obviously something that we have been highlighting for, for numerous from my first uh, mandate in council, which has gone back to 2014, that was a problem then. Uh, not alone are we only battling against the media, but unfortunately we're all also battling against the other trusts. You know, we have five trusts plus the ambulance trust, um, and we're battling against them uh, for to get consultants and doctors to, to our area. And unfortunately, they seem to be able to um, to put forward a more attractive, uh, a more attractive uh, contribution to to entice people to that area. Um, I suppose it goes back to my argument, and I will say this again publicly: um, uh, there's too many trusts for the size of our population in Northern Ireland. 1.9 million people with with uh, five trust is the total total madness. Um, but you know, there's not uh, there's not much more that we can that we can do about that. That's the way it is at the moment. Um, certainly, we want to see um, the the retention and and actually get get our surgical uh, our surgical um, introduced again in into SWA uh, sooner rather than later. And obviously, that's this has gone on now uh, probably nine plus months. And, and certainly, you know, we don't seem to be getting anywhere fast on this. Um, and, and certainly that's where we want to go in the long term. So maybe them's more comments than, than actually uh, than actually um, questions as such. So I just wanted to get that in there. Thank you. That's OK. Um, do representatives of the trust, there's two more speakers. Do you want to take... Shall I bring in the other two speakers and then you can make a comment when you've heard all three? That's probably best, Chair. That would probably be a good idea, Chair. We'll, we'll, we'll pick and choose the, 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 the uh, questions which, which are most appropriate to be answered. OK, Thank you. no problem. So we'll go to Councillor Mark Ovens next. Mark, are you there? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I'm in Town Hall at the moment and so the signal's a little bit iffy, I think, so apologies if I drop out, but if I do, I'll turn the camera off. Chair, there were a couple of issues there. I mean, the, there were two sort of very important agenda items merged, both in terms of the update on the elective general surgery, as well as then updates on both SWA, over, SWA elective overnight and OMA DPC. So with your permission, um, Chair, I made a note as just as the officials were speaking there, I was jotting down a few questions. So I have a list um, and apologies. It's okay, but you've got but, three minutes, Councillor. Don't forget that, so make sure they're all... Okay, so, okay, so I'll, rattle, I'll rattle through these questions. I'm just taking them in order of 
when they were discussed. Teresa, thanks very much for your presentation. In terms of the DOH position on incentives, um, whilst yes, you're absolutely factually right, the question I would have is, did you ask the department about the um, possible implementa implementation of new incentives, or did you raise concerns with the department about the limitations of the incentives? Because my rec recollection is that you didn't. Secondly, the general surgery review was mentioned. The very first action point within that review, and it's the number one action point, is that the trusts are to develop a co-produced implementation plan. The plan was produced in June. I know there was a stabilisation plan even before that. So while, while yes, you, you can try to say that the, the current arrangement fits in with the general review surgery, I would be of the opinion that we're completely outside of the planned implementation of that um, proposal. Your reference on confusion about Obs and Gowney, I agree with you completely. I couldn't understand from day one why the trust failed to get in front of that. I mean, I, some people understood that the emergency cesareans weren't conducted or weren't going to be impacted, but I, I just couldn't understand why the trust let that narrative get out within the public and cause such genuine concern. Number four, um, how involved were the trust involved with the SPP, SPPG risk assessment? Because I, we all know you didn't carry out your own, but my recollection of that, and it sort of fits in with the next question is, Tracy, you mentioned about a process and a, how a formal process was followed. My recollection at the time was um, there was anything, whenever it was first raised in October, the process was anything but formal. It was pretty chaotic. I mean, whenever submissions were going to minister, basic parts of the process hadn't been carried through. There's no SPPG assessment. So and my concern is knowing the timescales and knowing the event that was on the same day the SPPG risk assessment or response was then received to the department because I'm not sure if Neil's in the room. I can't, just can't really see there. Um, but that was the same day that the big get together was in the storm of hell on the redesign plan. Um, just rattling through these chairs because as I say, I mean, ideally, this, this really isn't ideal. There's lots of questions on the elective overnight centre and lots of questions in the DPC that we really should be going. I have to. 10 seconds left, Council. But, but my, my point is, Chair, you're, you're limiting members to three minutes on two or three very important issues. So, I mean, if with, with, if with your permission, I'd like to come back and then ask follow up questions specifically in relation to both and skill and OMA DPC because they are a separate agenda item. Okay, well, yeah, and we're um, covering the SWA and um, OMA on the agenda as well. Um, Adam, do you want to come in now? Hello, uh, Adam? Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay there? Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Um, obviously, unsurprisingly, I probably have quite a few points on this, Chair, and I'll try and be as quick as I can. Firstly, um, because it might be my only opportunity to speak, just to recognise the good work on elective care. Uh, and it just shows that when the trust puts its mind to it, it can definitely do good work. And I want to, to recognise that first. I do want to comment, and uh, sorry I missed the start of the presentation uh, as I was still working. Um, but there was a comment about the SOAS and, and the letters, the 30,268 letters, and that there was a fulsome um, response to this. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't help but disagree. It was tacked on to the end of the report. There was no recognition in the overall numbers. And, you know, 30,000, that should have been recognised at an early stage in the report. I do appreciate the number of pages that have been contributed on it, but that needs to be recognised because it, it impacts the figures that are against this. It should really be 99.95% against, not the 80 odd percent figure. So there's been no recruitment attempts since July 21. And this is very damning, in my opinion, as there was posts advertised for Alpha Galvin. And in terms of recruitment, the recruitment since July 21 doesn't fix the issues as they were Alt McGavin based. And it shows that there isn't even an attempt to fix this. Um, there was a question that there was, there was a quote in it, no impact to recruitment in general surgery in the trust, which is ridiculous considering they haven't tried to recruit for SWA since this announcement. Um, in terms of the, ret the retention incentives, I think the fact, uh, and I understand there's restrictions and the trust have laid them out very well, but they haven't developed a business case. They've admitted that and, they're, and they should have done. That to me is shocking that they haven't. And I would like to ask the question, why did you not go to the effort of developing a business case for this and presenting it? At the very least, it's the least you could have done and it was needed. And in terms of the negative narrative and my last point on recruitment is the negative narrative. A lot of it was caused by the trust and there needs to be acknowledgement by the trust of this and admit that maybe there was mistakes made. In terms of the travel point, the hospital travel scheme, you know, really putting that in there, it's a fob off, uh, you know, you, you can't, and most people can't benefit off from it because of the benefits and because of the restrictions on who can apply for it. And sorry, I'm talking very fast, trying to get through it. 
And I think the trust need to consider bringing in additional travel support for people who are maybe not on benefits. And I would ask, ask them now, will they consider doing that and for family members traveling? Uh, the, I'll skip a couple of points here, but the type 1 ED status, um, it does admit in this consultation report that there is a change to the definition in line with the English one, and that's, that's okay. But that raises the question, under the old definition, there, I would like the trust to say that there was a grey area on it, and maybe they brought it in line in England, but that was done with the intention of bringing back type 1 ED status because this change would have removed it. And I think that needs to be recognised by the trust as well. And I'm okay, getting you've got 10 seconds point. left. Okay, uh, I'll fire off three or four quick questions. What's the plan going forward? NIA shifts, the trust said that they were secured extra shifts. Where are these? Why are they not mentioned in the report? Are there any review dates planned? Are there any future uh, recruitment um, opportunities planned? And in terms of protected beds, there's been a failure there. Will those be insured in the future? Thank you, Chair, for the extra couple of okay, seconds. Okay, thank you. And to our guests from the Trust, um, Anne-Marie Fitzgerald has indicated to speak. So if it's okay with you, I'll let Anne-Marie in, and then you can... Yeah, is that okay? Okay, yeah, that's fine. That's okay, yeah. Anne-Marie, do you want to come in now? Yeah, yeah, welcome, everybody, and thanks for attending. And I suppose... Um, I'm not sure, Geraldine, if this is your first, it might be your second meeting since you came back with us, so you're welcome back after you're on this. So. Good to see you back again and hopefully that the, the pressure will be taken off you um chris cornell do a good job there but um yes um just just on that um, a lot of questions asked out there but i suppose i'm not going to go over the questions that has people been asked but i suppose it's a for more um practical point of view for myself for service users who are coming um from long journeys long waiting times and i'm chatting mainly more about alta galvin and about whilst everybody acknowledges the written times, um, just um, is there going to be a better provision of food and beverages there? What is it? Seating areas is crowded, overflow. They're standing outside. They're sitting in corners, sitting on floors. Um, every available space is up or taken. They're sitting on the wheelchairs. Um, have used um, a, a new um, implementation plan of going forward. Exactly what is that? Um, I know there's vent machines there, but they can be very, very expensive and poor quality. So I'm just wondering. What is going to be, is there um, going to be something going to be done about that? And the toilet issues there, it's quite compact, it's quite tight for that waiting room. It's a very, very noisy, it's very, very noisy, compact situation and um, just have my worries with that. And also just, and it's good to see that um, SWA is getting an overflow from other hospitals, but sadly it's an overflow perhaps from Craig Avon because the patients are coming in from further end, Sierra Man, different things, if Craig Avon's full. And that's the direction of travel from then. But I think it's grateful that the SWA is is, is open open for business for everybody. And just what this future staff and um, obviously you know, you're having constant talks with other trusts and with the department just about staffing levels and that. Um, will anything be seen in the future change or have you um, any other project work that's coming on, such as you know, as retention of staff? So I'm just wondering, or even um, I know that the the carers is probably still a thing. Um, um, maybe not a big an issue as it was, but it's still a big issue in some areas. So just ongoing talks, I'd say, at this stage. So that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And we also have Roisin. She's just put her hand up there as well. So we'll just take you now, Roisin, and then um, hand over to the Trust to answer some of those queries. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I was just going to give my three minutes. Did anybody else that wanted my three minutes? You can have three minutes. <laughs> can I give it Can I give it to somebody? Um, Oh, no, 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 that's, that's okay. not really how we do it. Do you well, have a question grand. to ask the Trust? <laughs> no, that's grand. Thank you. No, that's fine. Okay, I'll hand over to the Trust then if they want to answer some of those queries. Yeah. Okay, yeah, Chair, just want to first of all, thank you. Thank you for your, your counsellors for the questions and comments. The first comment I would make is I cannot strongly enough highlight that our emergency department has been a type one emergency department and continues to be a type one emergency department and is completely unchanged as a result of this change. Uh, so I just want to make that point first. I will hand over to Teresa to handle some of Mark's comments regarding risk assessment and other comments. First of all, Teresa. Thank you. Um, so Mark, I mean, uh, you refer to meetings and certainly I wasn't at um, 
and uh, events that I don't have knowledge of, but I'll, I'll, I'll address some of the specifics. Um, the, the, the review of general surgery and the requirement to develop a co-produced implementation plan, I think uh, I would contend strongly that our trust was ahead even of the regional review of general surgery in its intent to have a trust-wide review of general surgery services and to introduce um, and to move through a change program with the involvement of our staff, including our senior clinical staff, uh, and also patients. And we did, as part of that work, uh, set up um, direct links with patients um, through our PPI offices. And, and, and we did have patients and service users who were helping us with that trust-wide review. Um, obviously, what happened in October and November last year was an emergency change. And there is no, well, very rarely an opportunity to go through a co-production approach when you're moving through and into an emergency change. Um, so I would contend that our intent absolutely was always with any change to general surgery, including those that came through as part of the regional review, uh, adopt a co-produced approach and develop an implementation plan alongside and with our staff and service users. Um, but events did overtake us, uh, Mark. Uh, in terms of the uh, risk assessment approach and process, I mean, all I would say to the committee is that um, the issue of uh, staff and consultant staff and in general surgery in the Southwest Acute Hospital has been on the trust risk register for much longer than this uh, general surgery temporary change has happened well, well before it. Um, and, and therefore, we as a trust have recognised this as a risk. And it has been in all of our major governance statements um, it's been at our public trust board. Um, so, I mean, there, there has been complete transparency with uh, the risk associated with general surgery um, and our consultant staffing at the Southwest Acute Hospital. So irrespective of um, the, uh, the issues that happened at the time when the emergency change happened, Mark, uh, my um, point to you would be that we have been clear about the risk. We have assessed the risk. We have attempted to mitigate the risk all along, and that is what we did when we moved through the temporary change as well. Um, and I really can't comment, I suppose, any further on the uh, the SPPG processes around that. But uh, I think I, I would say that we were very clear and very transparent about it, Mark. Yeah. So, Neil, I'm going to hand back. Okay. To you. Uh, the next issue has been raised by a number of, of councillors is incentives. Can I give I'll give the background to incentives, and I'll pass over to my medical director to to discuss their general recruitment. First thing is the incentives has been, has been stated as for only applies to recruitment from outside Northern Ireland. I want to highlight that where we sit is that in sal salaries for consultants in Northern Ireland are behind the salaries of outside Northern Ireland. And that's due to a min previous ministerial decision to remove aspects of their salary. So therefore the incentives would not take, are unlikely to make any impact whatsoever in this, in this regard due to recent decisions. Uh, so, uh, so in terms of the general re uh, recruitment, I'll pass over to, to, to Brendan. Yeah, so I suppose the first thing I would say is recruitment is very difficult. This is not just in the Western Trust, it's across Northern Ireland and in England and Scotland and Wales. So to not accept that is really not very helpful. Uh, getting back to the salaries, I can actually give you some figures here. The average Northern Ireland consultant will be paid roughly 15% less than a consultant in England, Scotland and Wales. That's due to two aspects. The first aspect is the fact that we haven't had any increase in our pay, unlike other countries, because there's no one to sign off on it. And the second issue is, as uh, Mr Gokian has alluded to, one of the previous health ministers removed the Clinical Excellence Awards greater than 10 years ago. So we're really setting at about 15 to 20 percent less than England, Scotland and Wales. So the idea that if you get a premium of 10 percent, that someone's going to take a 5 percent pay cut to move here, quite honestly, is completely unrealistic. Now, the reality is this is not just something that affects the Western Trust. I'm aware of multiple teams across all trusts in Northern Ireland the vacancies. In fact, just this afternoon, I'm aware of one, uh, one, one team and a trust very close to here that is greater than 50%. So this is really, if it's not an issue in Southwest Acute Hospital, it is an issue everywhere. You also have to take into account, we now have a new consultant contract in the Republic of Ireland that has a starting salary of greater than 200,000 euros, 
versus a starting salary of approximately £80,000. So there are multiple, multiple reasons why it is difficult to recruit to consultant positions and quite frankly any assertion that the Trust has not attempted to recruit is absolutely wrong. Anything, anything else? Is it, is it? Sorry, I'll, I'll just hand over to, to, to Geraldine to discuss the, sta the staff stabilisation within the emergency department. So just to reassure um, Anne-Marie and other councillors, um, there's there's a couple of pieces of work that are ongoing, really robust um, sta nurse stabilisation programme across both emergency departments, Anne-Marie, in terms of stabilising and, and reducing our, our, um, our use of agency and replacing them with um, appropriate um, nurses who are, are coming in on our trust terms and conditions. At this minute in time, we know we have 19 new nurses already um, waiting to start Melton and Galvin and 13 in South West Acute. And as we go forward, we will continue on that programme. I'm very happy actually to bring back the detail of that to a, a future meeting. Um, in terms of the, the pressures on Alton Galvin, um, we have a, a bid with our centre at this minute in time, SPPG, around um, moving our minor injury stream out of the main ED department in Alton Galvin to another area to create the capacity that you refer to for the patients, the sickest patients that need to come into the emergency department. So we're just waiting on approval of that and the work will begin. So we're very, very much aware of the the pressures within the both departments, um, the, the complexity of the patients that are attending and the pressures on our staff. And this is why we need a good stable workforce. So there's a lot of work going on. And as I say, I'm very happy to give you more detail on that at a future meeting. And really in regard to food, etc., do, do you want to say anything, Theresa, in that? No, I think we've provided uh, Anne-Marie and the council with a yeah. response on that previously. Uh, and that can be circulated again if necessary. Can I just comment on Adam's, uh, Councillor Gannon's uh, comments about how we've expressed the Save Our Kids Services um, um, petition in the uh, consultation document. It, <clears throat> so where you have a consultation feedback report um, or findings report where you've had very few responses uh, uh, trusts do have an opportunity to insert all of the responses uh, in the consultation findings document when that happens. Now clearly, uh, and you can see on page 10, the number of responses and the range of responses that we had, and the fact that we had public meetings from which we gathered responses. You know, it was not possible to put everyone's response in. And we did treat the Save Our Acute Services 30,000 leaflets in the way that other trusts treat similar submissions. So we didn't do anything, Adam, I can assure you, that's different to uh, other trusts in that regard. Uh, those are treated as petitions and are referred to as petitions in consultation finding documents. And I just would say to you that uh, I would not agree with your assertion that we did not give weight to the Save Our Acute Service or address it properly, because in fact we spent five pages in the consultation findings report, responding to the five points and putting uh, to the public facts uh, about the assertions made in those five points because actually we felt it was extremely important to do so given the level of inaccuracy and misinformation. Um, so um, I, I simply would say that we uh, actually gave a lot of weight, uh, but the purpose that we did it was to put the record straight because we thought that was important. So I'll leave it at that, Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. That's, that's our responses. Then. Chair, we can't hear Sorry. you. Sorry. <laughs> just realised I didn't put my note on. So I was just thanking you there for those responses and just informing everybody that nobody else is indicating to come in there. So we're going to move on to item eight, which is to receive updates on SWA, including the elective overnight centre and OMA day procedure centre, please. So we've already provided those. Um, Mark has provided those updates in, the, in his uh, presentation, Chair around the elective overnight centre and the day procedure unit. We've already covered that. But there is an overlap here. We, we thought there was an overlap with, uh, with the findings yeah. report, so we've covered both in one presentation. 
that's okay and you're happy enough with that yeah so yeah. Um, that's fine yeah, thank you great. so um councillor mark ovens is indicating to come in so i'll let you in there mark thank you chair and it's, it's only really a few questions in terms of for firstly mark this goes this relates to your contribution. I do think we need to be careful, particularly when talking about elective activity within the South West Acute, not to try to con or not to conflate either indeliberately or deliberately or um, mistakenly conflate the issues. Because whilst I appreciate there are surgical improvements happening within the SWA, we also need to separate what separate out what aspect or what contribution the elective overnight centre is making toward to that. Because whenever I look at last week's announcement from the trust, and whilst it's Whilst I applaud, and as I said in the chamber the other night, I applaud each of the booking teams and all the theatre nurses and all the auxiliary staff and the surgeons themselves, obviously, I applaud everyone involved. I do think I, and perhaps many others, will have a different definition of success to what the trust and department might currently have. Uh, the figures last week were 164, I see the 172 now, 172 patients for an elective overnight stay centre. In eight months, it's pretty poor. It, it's it's more than poor, in my opinion. And I appreciate, Mark, that you talked about the, the increase in the elect the other elective work. But I would very much be of the opinion that they're two separate strands. So my one of my questions would be, what? Well, how does the funding work with the those lists? You you talk about the nineteen and a half lists, funded lists a week. How many of those are elective? How many of those are elective overnight stay centre lists? Um, are are they split up as such as that? Another question would be how many of, and I'm talking specifically the elective overnight stand, center or stay center lists. So how many of those lists with, with 170, well, 170 patients, you're probably talking about 40 lists really, or 40 sessions or 40 days. How many of them, so of those, how many of them were day case or how many of them were overnight um, as is implied? Importantly, how many of them were actually delivered by non-Western Trust surgeons? And by that, I mean surgeons who are traveling to Northern Ireland. And that includes, obviously, Mark himself. And I, I appreciate, Mark, I can probably preempt your answer. Your answer. You'll talk about surgeons traveling from the Southern Trust. Obviously, we're in an open meeting now, so I'm not going to name names. But I'm talking about staff who've had no previous connection with the Southwest Acute Hospital. How many, or if there are any, how many surgeons have been traveling to the Southwest Acute in a day, along with Mark. Um, in terms of OMA, then just very quickly, Chair, it was announced, Mark, it'd be useful if we could get a little bit more clarity or breakdown in just those OMA DPC lists. You talked about the increase and it's great to see the rebuild happening, but a year ago, whenever there was ministers in post, you know, we were told, don't worry, Minister, the rebuild's well underway and by this point we'll be at full capacity and by this point again we'll be even perhaps at even better again capacity and it just always seems that we're always a few months away from getting to where we should be. So my question would be in terms of a year ago, it was probably over a year ago, Robin announced there were going to be seven regional lists sent to OMA DPC weekly. How many of them lists are currently being delivered? Because I think you, he talked about the figure or, or there were figures being referenced about maybe 2,000 patients a year. And so in, it would be useful. And these are regional lists for the DPC and OMA. I appreciate the OMA DPC previously has been focusing quite heavily on Western Western patients, but specifically on the regional work. And then finally, Chair, my final point would be, I'm aware just from talking to clinicians from right across Northern Ireland, early starts or late starts, early finishes are still a big, big problem. And it was mentioned to me in the past that there are particular problems still within OMA DPC. So it's just to really get an assessment on where we are with late starts, early finishes, whether it's still a problem and whether the trust now is currently content with the level of activity being delivered by by OMA DPC, but also specifically by the Electoral Overnight Centre in Enskill. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Nobody else is indicating to speak, so if, um, I'll hand over to the Trust there, please. Okay, so, so Mark, Mark will answer those questions, Chair. I'll, I'll pick up some, some of what Mark has asked. Um, so when we're, we're very much on, a, on an incremental um, rebuild plan across both sites, and, and I'll come to South West Acute first. Um, we, I talked about 19.5 sessions. Ten of those sessions are inpatient. Five of those are for gynae, five of those are for general surgery. Um, and those five for general surgery are very much um, focused on that elective overnight stay centre. Um, as I said earlier on at the outset, um, the numbers for elective overnight stay mark is quite, quite rightly um, outlined, um, but there is a wider variety of elective surgery that is um, happening within Southwest Acute Hospital across a number of specialities, 
breast surgery, gynae surgery, pediatrics, um, pediatric dental, as I'd, I'd already outlined. Um, we are tasked with reporting on elective overnight stay, which is directly proportional to those five sessions that we talked about. Um, but in the reporting in the media last week, it's very important to highlight that other trusts also um, reported on core activity. What the region is now asking us to do is to report on that core activity alongside that overnight elective stay centre um, information. Um, we are on that rebuild, as I said, um, and we are now in the, um, in the process of uh, being able to provide 10 to 11 sessions uh, on a weekly basis. I also wanted to just point out as well too, from the point of view of um, when the count for elective overnight stay commenced, um, that was from March of this year um, right through until now. So there was a bit of a time lag um, in terms of when those numbers were to be reported from. And there was additional general surgery that took place um, between January and March. Um, in terms of the, uh, in terms of the um, capability and the capacity, we very closely monitor and within the trust through Strategic Change Board our utilisation of those sessions and making sure that we maximise them. Um, and you're quite right, Mark, um, early starts, um, sorry, late starts and early finishes do represent opportunities for capacity which is, which is lost, but within SWA um, we are meeting or, or close to the standard that we need to make in, in respect of those areas. Um, within OMA DPC, um, you're quite right as well too that the Minister um, did provide regional funding for an additional seven sessions, four of which were urology for the region and three of which for, uh, for general surgery. Um, we have been providing six out of those seven sessions. However, um, with some of the gaps in workforce that we've had, particularly from a surgical perspective, um, we have been challenged um, to put some of those sessions back, on, uh, back in place um, that were there pre-COVID. However, our trajectory at this present minute in time with some of the changes um, and job plans within the consultant teams, particularly in general surgery and in urology, will see us get back to 23, 24, and on some occasions 25 sessions in total out of the 30 um, towards the end of this month. Again, um, late starts, early finishes um, is an area that we focus on through Strategic Change Board, and there have been and will continue to be um, a focus in that area um, as we move forward. So SWA, um, in terms of where we're funded, as Teresa quite rightly said at the outset, um, we are funded um, for those 19.5 sessions and we do know um, that there is vacant capacity here, um, which is not funded at this point in time. Um, I hope that answers some of the questions. Teresa, is there anything you want to add from, from a performance I, I perspective? Do think it's in terms a, I do of think it's a pity, um, Mark, and sorry, just to say that um, we, we have been very clear that the sessions that we have offered to the region have been the five elective yeah. general surgery and patient sessions which we could no longer staff um, uh, because we did not consult the general surgeons. So uh, that is what we have been measuring activity of, Mark. Um, and as you look at other trusts, they have core activity, which is well over and above that. And, and, and if you looked at the equivalent to us, we would be counting the gynae sessions then. Um, and that is what they have been publishing. So it is just a pity um, that, that that has happened, but um, I guess we'll iron that wrinkle out and, and in future the department and yeah, SBPG will important. publish something that looks very equivalent. Okay. Sure. Or if I could just ask, um, it was the question I asked about the, the number of surgeons that have travelled to the southwest outside of the Western Trust, please. Chair, uh, would it be okay if we come back also on the, on the emergency general standards? Brendan would like to say a few words on that. Yeah, just uh, yeah. Councillor yeah. has um, raised that a couple of times during his questions. Now, the reality is these are standards, they're safety standards that we are obliged to follow. Um, when this was published, there was a recognition in the document that the minister signed that it would be effectively impossible for some hospitals to provide this. This was signed knowing that. Now, specifically, we're talking about access to extensive renal, ser renal services, cardiology, interventional radiology, and also to gastroenterology teams. For Councillor Ovens and the, the rest, I'm actually going to read out a couple of sentences because it puts this into context. This is what we have to follow. This has been signed by the Minister. The remaining hospitals, Causeway Hospital, Daisy Hill Hospital and South West Acute Hospital require more fundamental changes in a number of areas to meet the standards. 
it will be for each trust to consider what the response to the standards will be. However, there is an expectation that following implementation that all sites will, develop, will deliver emergency general surgery will meet the standards. This means trusts will have to consider if there has to be service reconfiguration as a result of implementation of the standards. This is not our document. This is a document that was produced regionally and signed off by a minister that we are obliged to follow. That's great, thank you. Chair, um, Chair, sorry, just could I, for the third time, about the question about the surgeons outside of the Western Trust, in addition to Mark Taylor, how many have travelled to as well? I think it would be inappropriate to, uh, to, to give the individual names at this stage. Um, I'm not, not, I'm not, sure. I'm not asking names, Neil, I'm asking for numbers. Small, small numbers, we, we accept the small numbers at this stage. Any? Yeah. Two in Noma? Two, two in Noma, yeah. Noma, but for the elective overnight centre in, in Enniskillen. Any in addition to Mark Taylor outside of the trust who haven't previously had connections? Is it one? Yeah, yeah we have one, yeah. And that's different to what I'm hearing, but. What's that, sorry? Just saying that, that's different to what I've been told, but. Okay, well, that's what I'm told here. So there you go. Okay, um, I think we'll move on um, to the next item, the please, um, which is... Can I, can I just go back on that last answer, Chair? I just want to highlight that the, the sessions yeah. are staffed. Oh, go ahead. So there's no, gaps, you know, there's no gaps in the sessions, so we have all our sessions been staffed, so it's largely irrelevant where the, the surgeons are coming from. You know, so so our, yeah. we, are, we can't deliver more than 10 sessions at this stage we, because of uh, other staffing in terms of nursing, etc. We will be developing towards, it'll become more of an issue, Mark, when we move towards 19 and a half uh, sessions in December. And that'll become then a, a real issue for the region. But we are well open, very, very open with the region on that. And we will be working with the region to have consultants to man the sessions. So because it's in no one's interest in Northern Ireland to have sessions not been filled in, in South West Acute Hospital. So I, I believe you know, we, we've done exceptionally well recently and we have received the award from the Department of Health in recent times. And I would ask everyone to get behind the, the team here in terms of that excellent award that they've received for, for productivity. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so if we move on to um, item nine, um, the members' queries. Um, I know the Trust, you've seen these, I'm guessing. And yes, so um, five there if you're happy enough to, if you can answer or give an update on any of those issues now, that would be appreciated. So given the, the late notice and receipt of these queries, which have come in just really um, very end of last week and two further after your full council meeting on Tuesday evening, it is an impo impossible for the Trust to answer all these queries today. So I am proposing that we will provide our trust officers will provide a written brief as part of the monthly public reps brief um, or indeed if there's a specific item that we can update on the scheduled agenda at the next meeting i'm very happy to do that as well i just have two comments around two of the queries um, the first one being um, the update regarding query four update regarding waiting times for orthopedic surgery i just want to point out that the outpatient waiting times as a public information. It's on My Waiting Times Northern Ireland, the public portal, and any member can access that. In terms of the treatments for orthopaedic surgery at um, inpatient and day case weights, these are available on our website and they're actually broken down by body part. So in terms of a, a, a wait for knee surgery, hip surgery, ankle surgery, that information is all there. So my question is, is there a specific query that the, the member raising this and has around orthopaedic weights that, that they can't find on the portal or isn't on our website. I, if they could come back to Chris or myself, it would be good. And then the, the query five update regarding cancer patient treatment. Um, again, I would potentially like the specific query around um, the service area or a treatment that they have so that I can answer it fully, please. Um, yep. So that's a bit... Yep. On the trust today. 
So that's been recorded. So based on that, then, if we could ask that the other questions, or if you get the specifics to the two that you've just mentioned, if we could have them a uh, written response, maybe we'd be happy with that as well. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. That's lovely. That. Thank you. Um, let's see now. So we're now going to item 10 to agree priority agenda items for our next meeting. Um, do we have any ideas ourselves? No. <laughs> I, is, it, is anybody in debt? I would like, um, I, I just want to say that when I was out canvassing um, for the recent election, um, I didn't really have any queries around the um, surgery at all. But what was a major issue and what I would like put on the agenda, if that's okay, is community services, com you know, community care, in the community and it, it's a massive issue out there and I'm, and I'm not expecting the, you know the, the, anybody to have a magic wand but it is a massive issue out there and we know because there are people that um, are, are in hospital that could be at home if that care was available and I think it's a it's a big issue especially not just in rural areas but it is an issue in rural areas as well as the main two main towns and I personally would like um, you know a discussion around that if that's with everybody's in agreement. Chair, can I can I wholeheartedly agree? However, uh, can can I ask that we maybe try to split it up into bite-sized chunks? Our community service is the majority of the services in the trust, and I would hate, I would want to do it a proper, you know, I wouldn't want to do it at this service. So I think if we come forward with a plan for over the next series of meetings with elements of our community services, and we we do presentations in each of them, would that be yeah. okay? Because yeah. I yeah. think the danger is you, you lose some of the nuances if you just look at it in totality. There's so much in our community services, but yeah, anyway, I, I think understand it's that because yeah. we do have a, a, a tendency to over. Over, over concentrate on, on acute services when the majority yeah. of our services and, and our resources are lie outside the building of a hospital. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. And yeah, I'm happy with that, yeah. So, so we'll develop something up if that's okay and we'll, we'll share that through, with the, yeah. through the officers if that's yeah. okay, Chair. Yeah, that's 100%. Thank you. Roisin, do you want to come in then? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to second that, um, if I can. And um, just also to bring something else, um, I don't know if you're aware or not, um, I did bring something um, forward in the one of the committee meetings about um, the Ashes Centre in Oma. Um, we haven't heard anything back as yet. I don't know if you're aware. Um, the, before the pandemic, um, the Ashes Centre was delivering services to people who have, have addictions. They were having um, a meetings and stuff at, at the centre, you know. And um, since before, since COVID, um, those services have never been put back into into place for people, um, alcoholics and drug addictions and stuff. So I was just wondering if you if you have heard anything back, or is this the right time to speak to you about it, or um, that would be great if somebody could answer me. Are you are you happy if that was added to the added, or if anybody could even answer it today? Even <laughs> it'd be great. But if not, and that's that's grand. And next meeting is perfect. Thank you. Well, maybe maybe we'll add addictions to our community uh, plan over the next period. Okay, we'll, we'll include that. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, there's nobody else um, indicating anything. So I suppose an update on both the hospitals um, is always going to be looked for on any of our agendas. And then I suppose the questions that um, arise throughout the next few weeks um, coming from members that we can send to you hopefully um, a little bit sooner maybe than what you got this week. Um, Anne-Marie, you, you're indicating there? And we will, obviously, we will have the written brief from the, from the uh, issues raised today. Uh, and, yeah. and, and obviously, yeah. if there's any other issues in the meantime, the Trust will bring, bring them forward as potential agenda items, if that's okay, Chair, yeah. to make sure it's all. Yeah. 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 And I, yeah, thanks, Chair. There's always the last one in the class, isn't it? Um, I was just wondering um, for future meetings, even a breakdown of um, autism services between 
just the waiting times for um, young people and for the over 18, the adult um, ASD service as well. What is the waiting times for that? Because um, I'm just figuring out, is it quite a large wait for um, people um, to get on it? And I know that um, it's very difficult. They're all so different. But um, is that sort of like a two year one to one or is it future programs or is it I know that some autistic adults would just like maybe a review every so often. Um, it's quite difficult. And I think that if they felt that they just weren't put out in there after their two years or whatever, just with somebody one to one, just a wee bit more of an update. Services just and I've been very aware of the news this morning, um, just about um ASD and um, mental health and um people who are dying by suicide. So that's basically what it is. You can get. So thank you. Thanks, um, we will cover that. Maybe we'll cover that in our written response. Sure, we'll take that as one of the queries for today's meeting. Sure, we'll, we'll rather than do a separate presentation. If that's okay. That's fine. That's lovely. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. That's lovely. Well, nobody else is indicating, so we'll move on to item 11 to confirm future schedule of meetings, which is Tuesday the 14th of November at 3 o'clock, Wednesday the 7th of February 2024 at 3 o'clock, and Tuesday the 14th of May 2024 at 3 o'clock. Is everybody in agreement of that? Oh, Eddie, can you, are you all right? Are you, you're indicating to come in there? Hello? Councillor? Hello, sorry, apologies. Oh, um, my, my connection, I'm on holiday in Donegal, my connections are horrific. Oh, lucky. Um, the, there was one thing I just wanted to raise <clears throat> with, uh, with the, the, the trust regarding, there's a, a separate project I'm, I'm undergoing with uh, uh, somebody from SPPG regarding uh, cost-effective prescribing um, of, of medication in primary care. Um, it's a massive, massive cost at the minute to us. Um, but the secondary care, unfortunately, my, I haven't actually worked in secondary care um, as, as a pharmacist. It's not an area I'm I was feel um, at some where point in the, in the, the future, there? if I could be accompanied by some trust staff and, and, and actually have a look at how um, how medications are are ordered and and transferred and things like that in in a hospital pharmacy, and and the second part. Sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm, can you pick me up again? No. We keep losing you. Maybe if you can email that Hello, in. Can you hear me? Eddie, we can't hear you. We keep losing you. So maybe if you email that into one of the yes. um, yeah, trust okay. staff and they can get back to you directly with that. Is that okay? Yeah, we, we, will, we, will, we will handle that. Uh, if you want to email be. us in. Oh, we, we or will email it in into okay. us and we'll right. pass it on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That's great. Thank, thank, thank you, Chair. Okay, um, back to the um, schedule of meetings. Is everybody in agreement with those dates? Yes. Yep. Yes. yes. Okay, so we'll go to item 12, any other relevant business, and I've had nothing handed in to me, so um, there isn't any. <laughs> and we will now go into confidential matters. Can somebody propose, please, that we go into confidential matters? Somebody propose and second. I propose. I propose, Debbie. Thank you, Anne Marie and Roisin. Your second. Yeah, I second. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. So we'll go into.
next slide, Sam. Thank you. Just hand over to John now. Yes, thanks, Chair. Just, just to confirm uh, for the public uh, that uh, in confidential minutes, uh, members consider the mm -hmm. confidential minutes of the Health and Social Care Subcommittee of the 17th of February 23, and there were no matters arising. Thank you, Chair. Um, and that brings our meeting today to an end. I'd like to thank everybody for taking part and all the people there in, in the trust as well that have come along and, and answered all our questions and queries. And we look forward to um, good, positive relationship going forward. And I want to thank everybody for coming. Okay? Thank you very much, Chair. All the best, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.